And now our host, Stephen Lee Morris. In last week's episode, I announced that our guest this week would be Joanna Klass. Life intervened and Joanna will actually be joining us next week. This week, we're extremely privileged to have joining us as a guest, Che Yu. Che is a playwright and director whose plays include porcelain and a language of their own. He's internationally recognized and produced. And from 2011 to 2020, Che served as the artistic director of the Victory Gardens Theater. Che Yu, welcome to Animal Farm. Great. And am I a pig or am I Miriam? <laughs> that is in, entirely up to you. We're, we're extreme, we're benevolent in our assignment of, uh, of, of animals that you wish to play. Um, you have such a distinguished career in the theater from as a playwright and as a director and as the, uh, it, the artistic director of a major theater in Chicago, the, the Victory Gardens Theater. Um, the Victory Gardens Theatre has undergone some, should we just say, changes of late. Uh, Luis Alfaro was on the show a couple of weeks ago and he talked about um, in their selection process of, of an artistic director to replace you, there was a walkout of the resident writers there, not resident artists. Um, so I just wanted to, th this uh, was probably af slightly after your tenure, but you were obviously still engaged in some way. Um, uh, my first question to you is, you're in a plum administrative position as a distinguished artistic director at one of the country's leading regional theaters. Why did you choose to resign? I think it was time. I mean, I was actually thinking when I first took the job that it would be a 10 year period and then I would leave or yeah. Maybe upon introspection, there may be a better challenge and I'll stay on. And during a board retreat meeting in November of 2019, um, you know, it was there were a bunch of slides, what we did, I was happy to see it. It's like, this is your life. Did that, <laughs> did that, and then it came upon to me that I have done exactly what I set out to do. And the theater was actually- Which, very, I'm gonna interrupt you there. Which is what? Um, Basically, we had three years of being in the black. Our subscribers um, that first left our theater, um, when I first arrived, 50% of my subscribers left, mm -hmm. most because of programming, because it's a new leadership. They were unsure. Mm -hmm. And the churn rate, which is basically their return, is one of the highest in the country. We were doing very well. And for the first time, it felt like um, it was ready to be handed off. I basically didn't want what happened to me to happen to another leader, which was I was given a theater that had red numbers in it and I didn't know it. Um, I was given a different kind of sheet during my interview and it took three years to get it back to where it was. And the changes together with my staff and my board that we have created, I just wanted the next leader to have a sense of success, you know, without the burdens from the last administration. So it mm. felt like the right time. I think in any moment of theater leadership, you should know when to leave. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Um, what was it you had mentioned in, in a chat we had before we hit the, hit the record button, you had mentioned that in a way what is happening or what happened at Victory Gardens Theater is emblematic of what's happening to the American theater in general. Um, why, what was the cause of their suffering, um, of their financial suffering that is, um, and um, you were able to fix it. How did you fix it? And, uh, well, we had to do a lot of cutting. I mean, the problem hmm. um, cutting is that you can cut is very simple, but at some point, the things that you cut, you have to replace. So basically jobs were cut, one person doing three jobs, you know, that, that yeah, kind yeah. of yeah. And then how do we get the audiences back? And at some point, the theater, what we kept doing, created a community of people that kept coming to the theater. So we were building the theater in an interesting way from ground zero. Mm -hmm. And you know, even I took a 20% pay cut. I mean, I took one then and I continued to take so to the last day of, of my tenure at Victory Gardens because it felt the right thing to do. Yes. 
Um, so once that kind of leveled off, we were doing well. We were building the audiences, doing the place that we wanted to do. We were in the right groove. And having done it a few more years, and the fact that the theater felt really good. I mean, the plays that we did went to New York, went around the country. It was time to hand it off because I felt I did what I promised myself and the board yeah. Um, yeah. what I would have done. So I, I did it. Wondering if you could be a little more specific about something that you mentioned earlier, and that's when you came on, you, you said a, a large percentage of the subscribers left because of programming changes. I'm wondering if you could be more specific about that. What it was it they wanted and what is the cost of losing half of your subscribers? Maybe it's not so terrible. No, it's not. But on the other hand, you know, I mean, we can, we as artists would say, that's great. Let's keep doing the things we want to do. But as a theater leader, you have to be very conscious of the fact that it is still in a very strange way of business. And you have to <laughs> sure keep afloat because if you don't have money, you can't do the next play. Yep. You can't pay your artists. You can't pay your staff. So there is always this weird tension between what you need to do to ensure that there is some sense of financial fluidity and also constantly risk taking. Um, yeah, yeah. And that is a very difficult um, balance to always strike. And sometimes we'll do the one play that we think people may show up and they may not. And the play that we think is the most adventurous and no one's gonna show up and they do. Yeah, it's very so, interesting. That's very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I think it's something that, it, and the person that we always talk about is Gordon Davidson in the Market Before Forum years back. He did the same thing. And I could see how I remembered how much he struggled saying, I believe in this play, I'm gonna put it all no. Yeah. and produce it and yet no one showed up and yeah. yet when he believed in something because he felt this is a play that la needs to see people came so i think in a wonderful way learning from him and i don't think i'm that original i think i took a lot of my cues from watching gordon lead yeah. the taper um in response to what your your question was um i had to replace a play at victory gardens that i felt it wasn't ready at the time and i brought this is a in new a new play a new-ish play. Okay. Let's say that the let's just say that the playwright wasn't in the place in a place to rewrite it because she had a TV show, so I offered to kind of postpone it and in lieu of that put in a hip hop show with universes. And there are a few things. I mean, you always have to figure it out. And for me, it's a learning lesson. And um, coming to Chicago at the time, I had to dramaturg. You know, the history, the culture. How do people receive certain things? And through this particular show, I was also taught a lesson, which is basically there was at the time more of a love for plays in Chicago that were realistic, that had a linear <laughs> progression of events. Yeah. You know, yeah. David yeah. Mamet throwing chairs, yeah. that yeah. kind of play. Yeah. And I was, I said in the press quite quickly that for my first interview in the Tribune that I really wasn't a big fan of realism and I got a lot of flack for it. Mm -hmm. And that's good because mm -hmm. I need to figure out what, how to meet my audiences halfway. And yes. this particular play was nonlinear. And the people who love new plays and adventurous plays stayed on. Those that felt uncomfortable with it walked out of the theater and said, I guess this is in your grandfather's Victory Gardens again. So I think it's one of those moments where there is always a come to Jesus moment for a new artistic director and the current audiences that they have, he, he or she has inherited. Um, I remember the story of a theater in Poland where a, they just decided to change the way they were gonna do business. They were going to change the generation of the leadership and the entire audience base left and the, uh, an entire new audience came in. My question is, did you, were you able like that theater were you able to? Uh, yes, we did actually. It was kind of a surprise because we had <laughs> made a commitment because God bless the board. I mean, I said, if you are choosing me to run your theater, you know what I'm standing for and what we're going to be doing. So we're going to find a way back in 2011, what is to diversify the audiences and the work on stage. And they basically gave me a carte blanche. Mm -hmm. And we kept building those audiences and ultimately- With-, with non-linear-ish. Well, there were some of those. I think what you learn is you have, it's a push and a pull. Sometimes you give them what they want in terms of aesthetics and sometimes you give them something really different. And the most important thing is, I've always said to my board is, we have to understand what the value of this theater means to our audiences. That means they could come here and not like something, but they know they're here because there's a reason to be and they are fulfilled. So 
you know, if you come to a play that's experimental, they may say something very different and you may disagree with it, but you'll come back again. Yeah. So yeah. I think it took time to create that kind of space, that kind mm -hmm. of um, art. And in the end, we saw younger audiences, um, younger audience in our theater, and including a more diverse audience. Yes, that was, was the question. Thing. Yeah, yeah. It, it took time. I will say that it wasn't easy, and I will say that it wasn't overnight. It yeah. is a commitment. If you're going to do it, do it. If you don't, don't do it. And this is, I take it, I will infer, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I will mm -hmm. infer that when you say this is a metaphor for what the American theater is going through right now, this is pretty much it about kind of swapping out an entire generation and an entire aesthetic and bringing in is that true or is that an well, over I, i'm personally i don't believe in um throwing things out i believe in evolution yeah. i believe this yeah. the idea of making room hey you have this space it's now time to kind of open it up you know, to your younger people, to the people across the street, to the people you sit on the bus, so that we can actually come to the theater and experience something together. Mm -hmm. For example, I mean, I did this one play, which I commissioned because I felt it was important to talk about gun violence in Chicago. And Marcus Gardley wrote this beautiful play called The Gospel of Loving Kindness. I never forgot this. The first scene was a monologue and the audiences were stunned because they didn't know how to react. The black audiences said, suddenly this character is talking directly to me and has never ex I've never experienced that before. Usually there's a filter. And then they were responding and laughing. The liberal audiences, which most of us are, could we laugh because we really are not sure. And the older audiences were upset because they didn't understand the references in the, the, yeah. the particular yeah. scene. And I had to say, you know, in, in a wonderful way, I hope, is, well, you take an opportunity to have the same experience with Shakespeare, which means for the first 10 minutes, you attune your ear to a different language, you give it your moment, and then in the end, the play speaks to you. And also, now yeah. you know how all of us who see white plays feel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it's okay. That means the plays do not have to pander to you. You have to work a little bit to go into the play. Yeah. And I think as a the result of that, our audiences have become a little more sophisticated um, throughout the, my time at Victory Gardens. Was the issue the content of the monologue or the structure of the monologue to open a play? The content. I uh, mean, it yeah. was language. And it would be like, why, you know, why are the Black people laughing? Why am I, what's, what's going on? So there's a some kind, of, kind of entitlement, right? Which I understand. You yeah. know, you, you want to come to the theater to be comfortable. Well, I think we come to the, to the theater to figure out who we are to each yeah. other and to ourselves. And sometimes that may create some discomfort or some delay in appreciating what is in front of you. Yeah, 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 very interesting. Um, and so you left mm -hmm. and then, <laughs> well, you, I, left, you left really with a, a sense of, of, of accomplishment, really. I mean, and, mm -hmm. and that you had fulfilled, as you say, what you had, had come there to do. Yeah, because I, I really didn't think that it was more about accomplishment because I always felt artistic directorship was service. Yeah. I wouldn't have basically run a theater and, um, if not for all the bullshit I've been saying about American theater on panels for many, many years. And people caught my bluff. You know, you talk a good game. Why don't you just run one? And I felt it had to be the right one. And when Victory Gardens came about, it felt like the right one because they did new plays. And I said to myself, this is a weird opportunity because during the time in 2011, a lot of people were not moving from their positions of artistic directors. Generations of artists were passed by without the ability and the opportunity to run for to run theater. So when this came up, I felt it was the moment for me to mentor a new generation of leaders and artists, and also to put to practice what Gordon Davidson had taught me. How can the theater belong to the people? What is it to create a town square, a town hall for the people? How do they own this theater? How do we tell stories that matter, that speak to not only the issues of the communities, but also to celebrate everything that they have accomplished? Because in the end, I think, this is my personal belief, all American stories are very, comes in different stripes, different colors. And we have to say to ourselves, my, the American story that you inherit is a black one, it's an Asian one, yeah. it's a brown one. And that's your history too. So if you're only hearing one narrative, there's something wrong. 
Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. And then, um, so your, what, what's the timeline on this between your stepping down and then um, a whole group of artists stepping away and for what reason? Well, I gave notice, like I said, in November 29, 2019, and yeah. I was essentially a lame duck through June of 2020 when I had to leave. I was not privy to any uh, and all of the uh, board and executive management's business. The board chair confirmed to me that this was a decision they had decided, which I disagreed, but respected. I think ultimately it was unfortunate because it was my hope to have been a resource to them to find the next leader for VG, as I've been throughout my tenure there. Yeah. All I can comment on my end was the theater's mission was founded on equity and accessibility, and the initial search process unfortunately did not I would say reflect these values, hence the public outcry and hence the artists leaving. Mm -hmm. And um, what part is the metaphor for the American theater? Uh, your transformation of the theater or this um, scandal? No, I, I, th I think, you know, because of this new leadership that they had to undergo, whether it was a saving gesture, save money saving gesture, which they were telling to the press, which as I've articulated, but we were in the black for three years, which is a rarity in American theater, so I don't know, or whether it's personal ambition or a new structural change. The rocky transition would have been avoided if there were transparency and honesty. And these are the two things that American theaters right now are reckoning with, particularly in the We See You White American Theater movement. You know, I think it's, it's no longer the, a cabal of leaders plotting and doing whatever they want there is this questioning of how are we speaking to each other? What, tell me what you're doing. How yes. can we be involved? And is there equity? Yeah. I mean, going, I, I don't know why I'm keep talking about, to, about Gordon to you because I guess we have this LA history. Gordon opened that door a long time ago in the eighties and the nineties. He believed that he needed to represent LA on his stage. And I feel it is actually the right step. And at some point, you know, after Gordon's generation, how does theater leadership become equitable and reflective of our very inclusive cultures too? Mm -hmm. So these are the reckonings that I think American theater is going through. Again, I'm not saying, hey, leave, everyone come in. I think there should be grooming and mentorship of the next generation of leaders. Everything, it's a place where everything remains possible. Everything is possible where it hasn't been possible before. Everything, needs, everything is possible like we perceive in the American theater. But I think we have to be also very vigilant because if we think everything is possible and not work for it or not fight for it, it will not be possible. There's always someone who wants ultimately things to be the same. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking big picture and mm -hmm. I'm thinking when you wrote Porcelain and that propelled you um, to a certain level of uh, notoriety. And then um, you started directing other playwrights that uh, had some simpatico with your vision. And then this, this was an international phenomenon. You were very successful at the Royal Court Theater. They, they welcomed you into their doors. Um, my question is in the year 2021, as you look back over those decades, um, do you still have that sense of fire and um, possibility or has it been burned out by time and experience a little bit? No, I, I think that this is still a fire. It's just a different way of lighting things. Mm -hmm. You know, once you're pyromania, anything is, you know, fair game. It may not be this thing you're burning, it's something else you're burning. Yeah. <laughs> And I think when I was younger, the, the, you know, it was all probably more um, insular. It's about me, my yeah. world, how I see yeah. it. Yeah. And I have yeah. to say, uh, yeah. again, which is, I, which is very interesting. Well, it was the 80s, the, you know. It was, it was the 80s, yes, <laughs> very 80s. And I think what was really interesting was um, at my time at the taper, I was actually opened up to a lot more communities and the idea of what social activism is and what is to ensure, you know, well, a kind of responsibility to make sure that the people have a piece of the theater, how we are actually representing people. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that became a whole different aspect of me, of my, the way I look at um, 
my art and the way that I look at theater leadership. And when Victory Gardens came, it was the right moment for me to explore that yeah. on a bigger platform. So you ran the Asian American workshop at the Taper under Gordon. <laughs> That's right. And it's particularly ironic, this, this little moment in history that they're suddenly calling for exactly the kind of programs that you were running back then under that leadership. That must feel very strange. No, it only shows you how visionary Gordon Davidson was. Mm -hmm. And I think we need visionary theater leaders. I think there is a lot of, um, there have been a lot of theater leaders who are just, you know, doing the right thing always leading the theater the way it always has been. But I think with this pandemic and some, and some I would say, changes in the last few years, required yeah. more visionary, out-of-the-box thinking about leading theaters. Yes. And it doesn't have to be the way it usually has been. You know, subscriptions, those, they've been complaining forever. Well, why don't you try something really different? No, oh, I don't know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And then it's the same thing. Yeah. Now, with audiences not showing up, they have to rethink this, which is great. Yeah. Sometimes it takes a pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> it takes a family, it takes a pandemic. That's right. <laughs> what are you, um, what's your sense of um, confidence that this is, uh, we're gonna make it through this? I, with, I, with the economic structures that are in place. I have to say that as long as there is a fire, people will gather and there will be storytellers. Yeah. It doesn't mean that it may be one of those beautifully lit 1,000 seat theaters. Mm -hmm. It could be the possibility of the re-emergence of smaller theaters. Yeah. This is just a thought, you know? If the economy is really gonna be bad, it's going to be global and national. And that would also mean that real estate is going to plummet. That would also mean if there are real estate pl places where the rent is cheaper or free, theaters are going to flow. It doesn't mean that you may get paid as an artist um, the way that you normally do, but the opportunity to be more um, risk averse, before, uh, to be more, take more risks, to be more creative, to find new forms and new aesthetics will probably be more of a possibility. That means ticket sales also have to be cheaper and smaller. So I think there is an opportunity there. I'm seeing that as like New York in the 70s and even, you know, LA in the 80s where small theaters kept coming up until real estate forced them to close. That's a massive silver lining. It's, it may be a massive silver lining, but I also think that big theaters to small theaters are now suffering. Now, I just don't know what that really means, but I do see an opportunity. And it also means, well, what happened to... Um, site-specific theater, guess what? It's the perfect time for site-specific theater. You have to go outside now. So people are thinking out of the box. And I hope that we don't really need a pandemic for us to think outside of the box, but if it does, keep thinking it that way. How do we come back? How do we do diff things differently? Is this an opportunity? We don't have to, if we come back and do exactly what we did before in February of 2020, I think we would have failed. I think the whole world would have failed. Yeah. Yeah. If you, do, if you don't le learn the lessons from it, what are, what are you doing personally right now? You're in New York. You're, 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 we're speaking, I mean, Southern California, you're in New York. So, yeah. Um, you, like I said, it took a pandemic. So I returned back to writing. Yeah. <laughs> There's some rewrites that I haven't done in 10 years because I was running a theater. So, you know, now I have no more excuse. Uh, <laughs> There's some directing projects, which uh, everyone's being optimistic about. So, I think when we come back, there may be some movement, but I'm going just to, you know, take it one day at a time and see where it goes. And meanwhile, uh, having this, look, some of us are more um, blessed mm -hmm. to, you know, even though there may be no income or maybe things are a little more complicated, we are okay. Yeah. I think a lot of other people are suffering. Yeah. I'm taking this pause to actually have a breather, read, you know, figure out what I want to say in, in the world when we come back. I'm also excited by the new generation of leaders um, in the theater, particularly, who have now taken upon themselves to figure out how to change the field. Can you name and names? I won't name names. You you know who they basically are. It, it's mostly, you know, people that you see quite visibly trying to advocate for change. Yeah. And for the first time in my life, I felt like, great, I don't really have to take the lead. I'm watching, 
I'm helping mm-hmm. and I'm supporting. And I'm really excited for this new generation. They're doing way more shit than we have always wanted to do. And I think they've had enough. You know, they've, they've had, had enough of the, 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 of, of the calcification. Yeah, I mean, you know, for us Gen Xers, we've always been the ones that, well, I have ambition, but I have to make sure you're comfortable so we can all move together on this thing, right? Now, mm-hmm. after all these decades, the, gener- the, the new generation is saying, no, I think we're done. We have to figure out how do we move it now and let's do it. And I love that. Mm-hmm. Instead of sitting back, waiting for someone to do it for them, they're taking, grabbing the bull by its horns and I'm doing anything I can do to help them. Che Yu, thank you for joining. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Steve. <laughs> Next week, we're joined by Joanna Klass, who runs, uh, founded and runs a performance and art center in Warsaw called the Curie Center. And um, Joanna is the point person for American artists working in Poland and Polish artists working in the United States.